Well, hello, With Gratitude Matt listeners. My name is Matt Moran, and I'm the host for the With Gratitude Matt show. Our goal with the show is to inspire our listeners to practice gratitude, regardless of how powerful the storm is. I have learned through the practice of gratitude that it's just, it is just like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. And oftentimes, in the most difficult periods of time, gratitude is what gets you through those difficult times. Today's guests are Dr. Eben Alexander and Karen Newell. Dr. Eben was an academic neurosurgeon for over 25 years, including 15 years at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Children's Hospital, and Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. He experienced a transcendental near-death experience during a week-long coma from an inexplainable brain infection that completely transformed his worldwide view on the brain. A pioneer scientist and modern thought leader in emerging science that acknowledges the the primacy of consciousness in the universe. He is the author of a New York Times bestseller, Proof of Heaven, The Map of Heaven, and Living in a Mindful Universe. Karen Newell is an author and specialist in personal development with diverse body of work that rest upon the foundation of heart-centered consciousness. As an innovator in the emerging field of brainwave entertainment, audio meditation, Karen empowers others in their journey of self-discovery by demonstrating how to connect to inner guidance achieve inspiration, improve wellness, and develop intuition. She is a a a co-founder of Sacred Acoustics and authored Living in a Mindful Universe in conjunction with Dr. Alexander. Dr. Alexander and Karen, welcome to today's show. Well, Matt, thanks so much for having us on. It's great to be here today. Yes, thank you so much. Well, it's an honor to be with you today. And I thought maybe a good place to start might be, first off, how did you guys meet and actually start doing some of the work that you've done, uh, particularly with respect to living in a mindful universe? Well, I would say in many ways it started with my NDE that occurred back in November 2008 and the deep mystery that presented to me as a scientist to come to an understanding of it. Within about two years, I realized, you know, having read more than 150 books on physics, uh, cosmology, consciousness, etc., that I had to explore my own consciousness. This was not just about learning facts and kind of intellectual knowledge, but had to do with personal exploration. Uh, and I was, uh, within those two years post-coma, introduced to the concept of binaural beat brainwave entrainment, a very powerful uh, technology Uh, that had been really two centuries in development. In the late 20th century, a binaural beat brainwave entrainment was found to be useful for enhancing out-of-body experiences, remote viewing, etc. I was deeply interested in this powerful tool, and uh, that's when uh, I I started working uh, uh, investigations at the Monroe Institute, and that's where I met uh, Karen Newell in November 2011. Uh, We were both studying uh, these techniques to teach them to people, Uh, So we were in very advanced level courses, and uh, once I met Karen, I knew uh, we had a profound sense of sharing a life purpose, and uh, my journey has been made far more uh, wonderful in the, uh, you know, 11 years since then. So thank you, Karen. Well, thanks, Evan. (laughs) That was very sweet. Yeah, when we first met, I knew he had had this near-death experience, and I'd met others who'd had near-death experiences, and usually... They come back with really profound lessons based in love and connection with other people. And so I asked him, you know, what was that fundamental lesson? And for him, it was all about the science. You know, the brain doesn't create consciousness. And I'm thinking, well, why would anyone think that? Because to me, I always had this understanding that we had a soul and our soul is what inhabits the body. And so for me, the soul is what is the most important thing. And there's no way it could arise from consciousness because I had the understanding that souls were eternal, that we, you know, come and go from our physical bodies. And so it was a real eye opener after Eben had that experience and exploring all of these other kind of spiritual topics was new for him. 
And I had been up to that for many years, including exploring within my own consciousness. I learned how to uh, use the heart to kind of release old tensions and traumas that I might have had. And I was able to do that uh, by developing feelings of gratitude in my heart. And that I know is exactly the topic of your podcast, which is why we're so excited to be here having this conversation. And it all starts there, feelings of gratitude. And that is what allowed me to kind of get more attentiveness and awareness of what's going on in my heart. Because we're so used to thinking our way through, through our problems. And our emotions seem to have a mind of their own. And in fact, they do. And so if we can get more in touch with that sort of heart-centered awareness, we can find out a lot more about how our world really works. That is beautiful. Thank you for that. And nice segue when you talk about gratitude into kind of the next topic. So I, a lot of my listeners know how I found this whole practice. I, I think I mentioned on the front end before we started recording that I've um, had a recurrence of cancer in 2000, late 2018. And before we really figured out what we were going to do for treatment, I, you know, there was plenty of sleepless nights and I would like look for motivational videos on YouTube or, um, different, uh, social media outlets. And, uh, there's a lot of cancer like stories, gratitude stories, you know, these patients that were clear of disease and they had abundance of gratitude, but I thought, you know, I don't know how long my journey is going to be. I thought, why would I, why would I wait until I'm clear of disease? Now we, here we are three and a half years later and I'm not, I told you I have a surgery coming up, but uh, I, I really do think that the practice of gratitude has helped me. And I'd love your perspective on what it might've done for where I am today. Well, what I would uh, suggest is, in my own experience, uh, I would say ever since awakening from coma back in November of, uh, of uh, 2008, uh, that pretty much my entire life has been one of just gratitude. I mean, to go through that experience of an extremely uh, uh, lethal, should have killed me, bacterial meningoencephalitis, coma for a week due to this extraordinary disease, uh, for which my doctors estimated at the beginning of the week I had a 10% chance of survival after seven days deep in coma on three antibiotics on a ventilator. Uh, they thought my survival chances were down to 2% with no chance of recovery. Uh, and that's why the medical case report on my medical records is so important because it emphasizes the story and proof of heaven, but goes far beyond where I did. That was written by three doctors not involved in my care, but astonished by my recovery. Uh, but the thing is, they pick up just as I did on, on uh, what a miracle this was to recover from this illness and to have a full uh, kind of recovery of my cognitive function is really something that demands explanation. And in fact, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the peer reviewing scientists uh, who accepted that paper up my, on my medical records for publication did so because the explanation given to them by the three authors for my survival was because I had an NDE that allowed for this extraordinary, unprecedented recovery. That because uh, your NDE included that love. And because it included right? love, a sense of connection. Uh, and, you know, having been through that, and especially that oneness with that God force, pure love that brings so much uh, wholeness and healing into any of our lives, uh, gratitude is the only appropriate response. <laughs> you know, I am very, very thankful for every breath I have now. I don't take any of it for granted. I realize that my next breath could be my last one, but that's why I think it's been so important that I had the beautiful lessons of the NDE, you know, almost 14 years ago now, to help me to live a much more fulfill fulfilling life that acknowledges this primacy of consciousness, this oneness of mind, that we're all in this together, it's all through the binding force of love, and that's how we come into wholeness and healing uh, as a civilization. Uh, and each and every one of us can do so as an individual is through gratitude, through being grateful for all the blessings in our life and appreciating uh, every bit of it. Now, of course, there are the dark sides and all of that, but uh, bottom line is the gratitude trumps every bit of it. 
Well, I can share with you some of that dark side because my daughter, when she was a teenager, she's now 33. She has a child of her own. Everything is fine. But when she was a teenager, she was suicidal. She was cutting herself. She was depressed. And a lot of this she hid from me. I didn't necessarily know what was going on. But I know one of the things she did that uh, really helped her was she started keeping a gratitude journal. And so even when she you know, felt such despair and, you know, didn't feel like she had any friends and whatever it was, she could find each day that gratitude journal was to find one thing each day that you're grateful for. And she could always find something, whether it was, you know, the beautiful warm sun on her face or her dog that would always love her unconditionally. You know, she could find these things even in the midst of that darkness. And that really helped her to get through it. That was one of the primary tools that she used that really probably kept her alive was remembering those little things. And for me, the gratitude came in, as I said, when I started focusing on the heart. And it all started when I was using sound to get into expanded states of awareness. I was very interested in, you know, the kind of the more glamorous aspects of that lucid dreaming and out of body experience. But when I first started listening to these recordings, I would start to cry and I didn't know why. And over time, with the help of some facilitators, I learned that I was really just triggering emotions that had been suppressed, that I hadn't ever properly processed. And when the sounds would start and I would feel this, it made me very nervous. But over time, I learned that if I just allowed myself to feel whatever was coming up, that it would then be released. And the added tool that was so incredibly useful was this work of HeartMath Institute, where they actually teach you to generate feelings of gratitude within the heart. And so when I first started doing this, this was highly critical in my process. I, would, I could think of things I was grateful for, like my daughter did, you know, she would think of the, the many things she was grateful for. But the HeartMath challenge was to feel gratitude at will. And so I started thinking of things I was grat grateful for until eventually I could generate that feeling of gratitude. And that feeling of gratitude, really, it's a sense of love. It's this warm, kind of uh, glowing, growing feeling in your heart that you get when you actually generate these feelings of gratitude. And for me, it took a while. I had to think of all kinds of uh, experiences I had in my life. And for me, the, the magical moment was remembering when I was six years old, my uh, mother had taken in a stray dog for our family, became our family dog. And within a, a short period, she had puppies. And when she had those puppies, she had them underneath my bed. Now I was six years old and this was a magical moment for me. My mom probably thought it was a big mess. But for me, this memory of that, that life, you know, coming forth right where I was sleeping and the, the, the mother dog would only let me, you know, touch the puppies. It was a very special moment. And so then I remembered all the dogs I had loved throughout my many years. And I had actually just gotten a new puppy at that time. And wow, those feelings of gratitude welled up. And so then from that point forward, I learned that when I'm in the presence of someone who has this you know, resonant love energy, I feel it before they even speak. That happened when I uh, encountered Ram Dass, a renowned spiritual teacher who has uh, left this world by now. Uh, he, has, he has left this world. But uh, I also can generate it at will. Um, and it's a beautiful thing, especially when you're in the middle of a lot of anxiety. But it takes practice. Thinking of things you're grateful for is, is rather simple. Feeling things you're grateful for is the next step in that process. And that's where you really start to hit some pay dirt because that's when you're really managing your own internal emotional system. And wouldn't we all like to do that instead of just reacting to all the triggers in the world? And so that foundation of generating feelings of gratitude, heart math calls coherence. And so when someone is coherent, they're basically feeling grateful. And that coherence makes you more healthy. Your heart is naturally broadcasting its emotional state to people around you. So when you have gratitude in your heart, as opposed to pain and angst and worry and concern and judgment, then people are being influenced you in rather positive ways without you even having to say a word. And I call that the ultimate golden rule. When we can hold you know, these 
beneficial feelings in our heart. We're actually serving others as we're serving ourselves. And so this is a very, has been a very strong motivator for me to spend lots of time in those feelings of gratitude. And I think uh, Evan and I together bring that to a whole other level with his experience as a, a doctor and having been on the other side and bringing that energy back here. And all of us, it's our birthright really to tap into that energy and it just takes practice. That is beautiful. You know, um, there's a lot there. So one of the things, so when you talk about you as a six year old and the, the stray dog coming in, um, I have a, uh, an eight year old that, oh my gosh, I, I, no, I'm sorry. She's nine. Um, she would die to have that experience happen to her. And, and, and I can only imagine what my wife's reaction would be. Yes. I think there'd be a lot of judgment there, but, uh, somewhere inside that, I guess I'm, I'm thinking and moving and, and doctor, you touched on, you know, God a bit in, 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 in the, the pure unconditional love that he has that is much different than a parent's love for a child. And, um, you know, that's something that for me going through what I've gone through, I feel like I almost have a deep, I, I was raised in a very, uh, Christian household, but really never knew and understood God's full love for me. Like I do today as a result of the experience in, in the path that I'm on today. And, and for that, I'm so grateful. He, he loves us like no human being can. And, and because so often there is so much judgment involved in other people's love for us. No, I think it's uh, important to point out, for example, in, in life review, you know, your life flash before your eyes, which has been part of the, uh, you know, near death experience going back thousands of years, uh, that there's often a, a very deep sense of connection, like the oneness with that divine, with that God force. You sense the kind of healing and wholeness of that loving, you know, that pure, unconditional love uh, coming from that force that so many have described. I would say all of our religious systems have emerged from similar human experiences of connection uh, with the spiritual realm, you know, of a universe that's much grander than just this tiny little uh, observable physical universe. Um, and that uh, sense of oneness with God, I think, is a, a, a beautiful way that indie ears bring back that kind of fearlessness that when, when they've been through that, they realize that death of the brain and body is not the end of existence. In fact, in many ways, it's a liberation and enhancement of conscious awareness well, when we're freed up from the shackles of the cage. But it is so beautiful to realize that that God force of love is something that I came to see in my NDE as the very root source of our conscious awareness. So, uh, you know, so reassuring that NDE messages about this and the life review and, and especially in the ambience of that beautiful loving force of pure wholeness um, teaches us, uh, you know, how this gratitude, how this uh, kind of world of ideals is within our grasp. Uh, and it has so much to do with our beliefs, thoughts, and attitudes. And if you don't believe in any of this, you're going to be very unlikely to find it. If you do believe in it, you're going to find, like millions of others, that the evidence is overwhelming uh, and bundled deeply with this uh, kind of journey of, of joy and bliss and understanding with connection with the universe is extreme gratitude for this gift of existence. Uh, and to me, you know, that's right at the core of every bit of it. Uh, and of course, the other tool, in addition to gratitude, that human beings have access to, that I think is underutilized, is forgiveness. Uh, remember that, you know, the greatest uh, benefactor of forgiveness is the forgiver, uh, because it releases them from a prison, a self-imposed prison. And so I think with the tools of gratitude and forgiveness, human beings can go a long way towards liberating themselves from kind of a false version of not belonging in this universe. And I would just add, you know, you mentioned being brought up in a Christian household, as many of us, we both were as well. Um, you know, there's one way to practice religion is through the scripture, through the dogmatic teachings, through all of the kind of moral lessons that are in, often embedded in religious texts, all kinds of different religions. That's a huge focus. 
but to generate the experience of touching, feeling that God force. That's a critical piece that so many are missing. And some even say that that's a danger to go within, to meditate, to feel that connection yourself. And so it really is missing in a lot of religious settings, this experience of feeling that force. And of course, this can be done through prayer. That's something that uh, many religious people do, but the kind of prayer that generates feelings, that centering prayer, as opposed to just, uh, you know, thinking thoughts and sharing information and asking questions, you know, feeling that connection. So that's something that really could be brought into religions. And if even someone doesn't have a religion, you can still feel that connection to this God force. It's not exclusive. It is available to all of us. It's a divine right that we have as humans. We came from that source. We will return to that source. And so why not remember our connection to that source while we're here? The point is to live this life for a reason, but having that support and guidance as we go through that life is, is, can be so helpful to all of us. And it can be done with or without those dogmatic kind of scriptural teachings. You know, a couple of things come to mind there. You you bring you brought up meditation there just a bit, Karen, and and that's something that, quite frankly, you know, four years ago, it just wasn't part of my daily activity. It it is today. I I don't meditate every single day, but love to hear more perspective on meditation and and what it can do for, you know, not only healing but just pure wellness. Well, I really developed a of a pattern of meditation on a daily basis more than a decade ago, as I said a short while ago, when I after I met Karen, we were very interested in binaural beat brainwave entrainment for deep meditative states. And for me, it's always a form of centering prayer. Centering prayer is a way of getting into that, uh, that kind of peaceful silence and sense of love, of connection with God, without asking for anything in particular, but really just thy will not mine be done and a realization that you can trust in the universe and that uh, the statement all is well is very applicable when you start to understand these deeper layers of, of connection with the universe. And for me, meditating an hour to a day, and I always use sacred acoustics. For me, that's my, my go-to powerful mode for uh, deep uh, kind of disconnection with a sense of here now and a sense of self uh, that we're, we're so slave to. Uh, in these bodies, but to free our consciousness and start approaching that primordial mind uh, requires this kind of powerful uh, technique. And that's why I think differential frequency brainwave entrainment is so important. Sacredacoustics.com is my go-to source. So <laughs> I would recommend, uh, you know, people who are interested in this, I mean, there are many different ways to do it that you can find out there, but I've found that uh, the differential frequency brainwave entrainment from sacred acoustics is the most powerful and effective that I've run into. Uh, and I'll just explain yeah. a little bit yeah. about how that really works. I think of them really as, you could think of them as training wheels. And so many of us, especially Western minds, when we sit and attempt that first meditation session, it can be very frustrating because we think, oh, you just, you know, watch your breath and maybe repeat a phrase to yourself and then your mind will become empty. And that's not what happens. Your mind continues with these very distracting racing thoughts and very often they can be destructive or just distracting. And uh, so it can be very frustrating. But what we all need to realize is if we haven't done this before, it just takes practice. We have to learn, we have to train our brains to be in a different state of awareness where we have attention to the, what I call inner observer, that part of us that is remains neutral during all the activities of our day and just sort of observes what's going on. When you practice a meditative technique, you can gain more awareness of that inner observer. And so when you do have emotional reactions throughout your day, your observer can notice and uh, perhaps give you some advice in that moment. And with time, this kind of thing can become a, a daily occurrence where an inner voice can interrupt when you're in a, a challenging situation and help you get through it. And it comes through this practice of meditation. And so because we often have these racing minds, for me, this type of sound that Evan is talking about with binaural beats, anything that kind of makes a wah, a wah sound like a crystal bowl, a brass bowl, 
uh, gongs, tuning forks, they all are emitting natural binaural beats. But our recordings, we program them very specifically to get people into states of awareness associated with sleep, with meditation, with focus. And so that's how they serve as training wheels. Many people, when they listen, their distracting thoughts will calm down or they'll continue in the background, but they gain more awareness of holding their attention in a certain way. And so this practice, uh, these actual recordings and meditation in general can reduce anxiety, can help with depression. We had a pilot study that showed a 26% reduction in anxiety in a psychiatric practice. Those who had only therapy but didn't listen to sounds had a 7% reduction in anxiety over the same time period. So 26% is a much higher amount. So they can help reduce anxiety, help with focus, all things that are involved with having a successful meditative practice, but also very useful states that we often uh, find helpful just to get through our day, you know, focus, sleep, who can't just use a little bit of calming down in our very stressful world. So meditation helps with that and the sound helps to uh, enhance it or help you get there a little quicker. Yeah, the, the other thing I'd point out about the sound, the reason I was attracted to it two years post coma when I was first looking for meditative tools um, is uh, this this notion that every every other sound you've ever heard, a chant, anthem, hymn, what have you, that's induced some transcendental state of conscious awareness, every bit of that has been processed up in the temporal lobes, in the acoustic cortex, in circuits that basically have uh, uh, refined themselves in the last two or three million years in primates and homo sapiens. Very different are the neural circuits that handle the sounds from sacred acoustics and other binaural beat brainwave entrainment. Those circuits are more than 300 million years old down in the lower brainstem. And I think that uh, ancient nature of the circuitry that we're interacting with, with the binaural beats, uh, is one of the reasons why it has so much power to liberate conscious awareness from the illusion of here, now, and sense of self. The only other thing I'd like to mention along these lines uh, is that uh, the name of the game for me in meditation was to realize that voice in my head is not who I am. So many of us in this, this day and age, you know, that running stream of thoughts in our head is what we identify with. Uh, and in fact, the first thing I do in a meditation is let that little voice state an intention, uh, make a request, but then it goes into time out because there are far grander aspects of wisdom and connection with the universe and that primordial mind that can be investigated. That's what Karen's talking about, that neutral observer. Uh, getting in touch with that aspect of self is a extraordinary. And that's when you can see that little ego mind is the little uh, uh, operation that it is, but it's not who you are. And you have a far grander presence in this universe and that can be revealed through these deep meditations. That is beautiful. And for our listening audience, I will make sure that we have included in our show notes the uh, the website for uh, Sacred Acoustics. And uh, I, I look forward to learning, learning more about that myself. And I'm sure our listening audience will appreciate that as well. Well, and Doctor also, I'm just, just to add on to that, look for the free download so you can get a 20-minute file to try. It. <clears throat> and also the whole mind bundle are the exact recordings used in that pilot study. And also, I would just point out that a tremendous amount of what we're talking about here is greatly amplified in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe. So if people want to learn a lot more about uh, you know, meditation and the various other aspects of what we're saying here today, Living in a Mindful Universe is a great resource. Or Thank, you. Thank you for that. Com. Yep. So. Thank you for that, which will all be included in the show notes. You know, doctor, I uh, touched on just in the introduction that you spent... 15 years at Brigham Women's in, uh, in Boston, uh, been a patient of Data Farber for three and a half years. And I'm so grateful for all of those that, uh, have done the great work to, to, to get to where I am today. And just love to hear your perspective on, you know, the 15 years that you spent there in Boston. Well, I cannot say enough good things about Brigham Women's Hospital, Dana Farber, Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Uh, those were 15 of the best years of my life. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was like a kid in a candy store. Uh, I was able to contribute a lot to the benefit of neurosurgical patients. I wrote more than 150 peer-reviewed papers and chapters. Uh, all of that, if people are interested, all my publications and presentations are available on my website at evanalexander.com. But for me, it is something, talk about gratitude. I mean, uh, to have a very successful career in neurosurgery, 
uh, was a huge joy of my life and, and a tremendous amount of that success was just because I was fortunate enough to be at the Brigham with an absolutely stellar group of young, creative, brilliant uh, healthcare workers who wanted to really help patients and, and up, you know, change the game uh, for the better. And, that, and that's what's so good about Harvard Medical School and that whole environment. And even though you had this kind of inexplicable, some would say miraculous recovery from your medical uh, challenge, you are still a strong believer in Western medicine. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think I'd be here if it weren't for three very powerful antibiotics. Now, what my doctors will tell you is those antibiotics might explain my 2%, you know, fact that I kept on breathing through this and stayed alive. But the actual full recovery is something that is an absolute unprecedented medical miracle. Uh, and for that, uh, that's where all my gratitude comes from. But I am also convinced that a lot of that uh, Western medical intervention was absolutely essential for me to even get to a point where I could live through it and then have that recovery that was largely due to spiritual factors. Now, as I, thank you, as I hear you talk about your near-death experience, it sounds like it really transformed who you are today. And I'm going to, I'm going to ask a difficult question here because as I, and I think it, it really, it sounds like it has enriched your understanding of purpose in life. Um, and as a result of that, can you look back on that experience at all and say that there's any gratitude for that week that you spent in coma? I would say there's nothing but gratitude, uh, you know, for every bit of it. And people hear that and they say, well, yeah, you survived. So Sorry, our dogs are very excited about the fact that I survived. Yeah, <laughs> They're voting their I confidence. think it's a bunny. It's a bunny. bunny. Yeah, there's a bunny outside. <laughs> uh, but really, gratitude, uh, to me, it's kind of a retrospective discovery that it was uh, probably the biggest factor in my uh, uh, kind of spiritual healing and physical, mental, emotional healing from that onslaught of bacterial meningoencephalitis. But the interesting thing is I've come to realize I'm grateful for the fact that I had the meningitis. Just like, uh, you know, as I've, I've talked before in my story and mentioned in the book Proof of Heaven, uh, there came a time early in my career where I stopped drinking alcohol. Uh, I realized, you know, I never had any trouble with it at work, but on my nights off, I was a little too tempted to that scotch. And in 1991, it was time to let it all go. And in looking back on it, I was grateful for being born alcoholic in the first place, not just for letting the alcohol go in 1991. And the, hard, the, hard, the hardships and difficulties in life in many ways are the gifts. And it's how we deal with them uh, that allows for the power of transformation and growth of our soul. Uh, and that was a beautiful lesson to learn to embrace the hardships, the difficult people, all the challenges in life and come to embrace these uh, hardships because in fact, they are the engines for our growth and transformation. And the more we can keep love, kindness, compassion, mercy for self and others foremost in our heart when we're making our decisions about how to live this life, uh, the better our pathway through life will be. That's unbelievable. I, I anticipated there might be some of that just based on some of your comments earlier, but uh, appreciate the, the, the deeper background on the gratitude that you have for that. Um, and I found just through just some of the struggles that without, you know, beyond just cancer, I it just oftentimes uh, those, those hurdles are really growth opportunities right. um, that, yeah. that, that create resilience for other hurdles that might be faced down the road. Well, sometimes you know, when it, people get a cancer diagnosis, their whole life changes. They start to really focus on what's most important. And so that's why these can be considered these gifts of opportunity. So there you have it. You know, it's funny you bring this up because my wife doesn't necessarily, uh, she, she, went, she questioned why would I start a show when I'm in the center of all of this. And today uh, she, she sees and understands the importance of continuing. Yeah. Because, you know, while our listening audience are going to really enjoy hearing Karen and uh, Eben today, um, I'm the biggest benefactor. You know, I, I'm directly getting to interview some amazing guests like the two of you. You know, um, proof of heaven. I just want to, uh, you, you touched on that a bit. You know, what are 
some of the things that our listening audience are going to find when they pick that book up and, and what could they potentially anticipate learning from that? Well, I can tell you one thing that uh, I certainly saw as an effect was there were thousands and thousands of people who had had a similar experience but didn't know what to make of it. Once they read the Proof of Heaven, it was like, oh, my God, now I get it. And that was one of the things that really drove those uh, uh, outrageous kind of early sales of Proof of Heaven was that other experiencers uh, were sharing, you know, how this kind of reminded them of their own experience and helped them to kind of file it and understand it uh, as the very real and instructive experience it was. Another thing you often say you're grateful for is having heard all of those stories. That is absolutely yeah. true. I mean, one of the greatest gifts to me in looking back on all this is by going public with my story, uh, you know, and, and publishing Proof of Heaven back in 2012, it opened the floodgates to let people reach out to me and share those experiences that, that they'd had. Uh, and they're out there in such huge numbers. That's, in fact, why I wrote that second book, the map of heaven. The map of heaven is really all about those communications from families and patients about their own experiences, which show that these are, are basically universal. And, you know, the, the conventional scientists would try and sweep these kind of cases under the rug. And it's like a game of whack-a-mole to try and, you know, dismantle each of these stories. But when you stop doing that and start accepting these this incredible ocean of evidence for the reality of a spiritual realm through personal experience that people have had, you realize what a gift it is to this world at large. And that's one of the main reasons uh, why I, I put Proof of Heaven out there. I realized my story was very important. You know, when I, when I wrote it, though, you must know that no near-death experience book had ever done very well on the New York Times bestseller list. So there's this myth out there in the public mind that somehow I, uh, you know, might have written this, made all this up for, you know, this financial gain. But that is absolutely not the case because when I was writing it and deciding to publish it, it was all about, uh, you know, risk to my career, if anything, because I was rocking the boat tremendously. But I also knew the facts supported an extraordinary case that had tremendous lessons for everyone about healing, uh, about love, about a connection, a loving universe, and an uh, infinitely loving God at the core of it all. And I knew that would be helpful to people. So at the end of the day, no matter what the personal hardships that I might face in publishing such a book, I elected to go forward with it. And of course, then the rest of it, the quick, uh, you know, rise to the top of the New York Times list, et cetera, was a giant surprise to me. I knew someday the book would do well, uh, but I figured on its own merits that would take years. Uh, luckily, uh, it did very well out of the gate. And I think a lot of that, again, was because thousands and thousands of people who would have had these experiences resonated with that journey. And that's why they reached out to me to thank me for sharing it, because it helped them to share their own story. And you co-wrote The Living in a Mindful Universe. Um, what was that like, writing that together for the <laughs> two of you? Well, it was, that was, uh, I can thank Karen uh, for, you know, organizing and kind of being the energy behind that book. We wrote it together. Uh, of what, course, you wanted, what you wanted to do was bring the real science forward, which right. really wasn't in the first Proof two heaven, books. Right. And we wanted to then also integrate spirituality to that. So not so that it was a straight science book but there's plenty of hard science yeah, in it a but mixed in and spirituality yeah mixed spirituality meaning um just ways people have connected and uh felt that love how they've found that their deceased loved ones are really still with us through their communications with them and and so on it it really shows the eternity of our souls and how we are all fundamentally part of that force, which that force is made of this unconditional love. If only we could get our thinking minds out of the way, we would have much, much more access to that in the here and now. And that's ultimately the message of that book, Living in a Mindful Universe. And it's been endorsed by a number of uh, leading scientists around the world uh, in consciousness studies, uh, people like Ed Kelly, uh, Jim Tucker, Bruce Grayson, all from Division of Perceptual Studies, people like Dean Radin, uh, people like uh, Bernardo Castro. Um, there's a whole host of Pim Ben Lommel. Uh, I mean, if you go to evanalexander.com, you can find a lot of those endorsements. But it's because it is very scientific, and this is naturally about a unification of our scientific and spiritual nature. But I made sure it was also readable for the yeah. non-scientific <laughs> mind. 
Thank you, I, I thank you for that because I it, had it not been for that, Karen, I probably wouldn't be able to read it. Yeah, <laughs> it, is. it makes it. I must say, Karen made it much more readable. No when he would about talk that. about quantum physics, I'm saying you got to get me to understand this first before anyone else will. And yeah. that's how we did thank it. Thank you. You know, so we we had a guest on one time, Dr. Roy Von Tom. A lot of my listeners will will know that name, remember that name. He talks a lot about. Um, he calls them the four houses of health, your physical health, your mental health, your emotional health, and your spiritual health. And if any one of those are off kilter, you leave your suscep- yourself susceptible to uh, being ill. And you know, one thing, you, you, we've touched on spirituality. We've touched on mindfulness already. The one area that we haven't touched on is this physical strength, being physically strong. Um, any thoughts as it relates to fitness and being physically strong in terms of being totally well? Well, I would love your perspective. I would say that it, you know, like so many things, it's important not to artificially break things down into too many pieces. Uh, I'm more of a lumper than a splitter. Uh, and what I realize is that any physical, mental, or emotional health is ultimately dependent on spiritual health. And when I use the word spiritual, it only has two ingredients. Or two three. Or, well, three, okay, uh, <laughs> requirements. Uh, one is this notion of the one mind, that we're all in this together. Uh, and that's really where our book and, and, and similar recently published scientific books like Steve Taylor's Spiritual Science go. Um, it's, not just, <clears throat> it's not just a realization we're all in this together. It's actually feeling that connection. Right, feeling the connection and the, living it, living it with your... Uh, with your phenomenal experience, that we're all connected. So spirituality involves that sense of connection to the one mind, that kind of heart of connection that we all share, uh, and also a, a sense of meaning and of purpose. Uh, meaning is something that has to do with the individual events of our life um, uh, and, and how they can line up and make sense. Purpose is much more about the much bigger, grander mission of our lives. But all of it is interrelated. And so spirituality is a uh, and this sense of connection, I think, greatly enhances everything that we consider uh, physical, mental, and emotional health. And to get back to your question, yes, I think spiritual uh, uh, growth and strength can absolutely uh, lead to physical, mental, and emotional strength and resilience. And, you know, there's this common term out there, mind over matter, where if you just, you know, repeat affirmations and you're, and clear your mental space that you can actually make it, it can actually make a difference in your life. But we like to say <clears throat> that spirit over matter is a little bit more apropos because it really is those factors. Do you feel meaning in your life? Is there a purpose to what you're doing? And do you feel that connection? That connection doesn't have to be to a God force, but do you feel a connection to your family? Do you feel a connection to a greater community? And some people do and some people don't. And when you don't have that, that's where you start to have trouble. And so that sense of connection is at all levels. And uh, this idea that uh, we can heal with spiritual kind of uh, factors, Kelly Turner wrote in her book, Radical Remission, she studied all of these spontaneous remission in cancer cases, and she found nine factors that contributed to their healing, and six of them were spiritual. Dealing with emotions, being in touch with your intuition, uh, feeling that sense of connection, feeling like you have a purpose, all of those things contributed to spontaneous remission in cancer. So spirit is much more critical than we may have thought. Lots of people just relegate spirit to the religious category and say, oh, it's a choice. You can be religious or not religious. But if we're all fundamentally spiritual beings, then it behooves all of us to really understand how that spirit comes into our lives and does affect us on the mental, emotional, and physical level. So it's kind of a new, newer way of approaching mental, physical, and emotional health with a focus on spiritual health. So that other interviewer was right on the money with bringing in spiritual health as an important factor. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. And as, as we kind of wrap up, I've asked all of my guests at the end kind of a a difficult question. However, you guys both have brought up situations in your life that were big hurdles, big, big, uh, you know, challenges that you faced. Uh, Karen, you touched on your daughter at 16 years old and, 
uh, Evan, you know, your uh, coma that you uh, lived through. Um, I'm going to ask the question in a little bit different sense. Um, we all face hurdles in life. That's just part of life, part of living. Um, are there things that our listening audience can do to prepare themselves to look at those situations as growth opportunities and to grow from them as opposed to be broken down, torn down, exhausted, and ultimately, uh, you know, look back on that situation in, in a very negative light. And I think both of you have exemplified through conversation today that you you grow through those experiences. And I'd love your perspective on what our listeners can do to look at their hurdles, perhaps in a different with a different lens. I think it's... Um important to remember. I mean, I think if you just look back through your own life, if anyone looks back through their life and, and considers some of those hardships that they faced up to, uh, you'll come to realize that more often than not, those hardships led to certain changes and understandings in life that in, in ways were very beneficial and contributed to more resilience and strength in, in kind of your soul journey. I think it's important to remember that the ego and, and kind of self-centeredness is a toxicity of our modern era. And so many people identify with that little ego voice in their head. And yet we know in addiction and alcoholism work uh, that the ego would much rather see itself survive and the host die uh, in some of these addictive states. And uh, that's why addictions can be so deadly. And you know, as of uh, March of 2021, we had more than 100,000 Americans die over the previous year of uh, drug ODs, a lot of those opiate ODs. Um, and so there's no question that there's a giant problem with addiction and uh, uh, that kind of kind of ego toxicity in our world today. Uh, and it's important for people to realize they can uh, basically bypass a lot of that kind of insanity in their own life through meditation, centering prayer, different ways of going within to connect with that greater sense of self beyond the little ego mind, the little voice in the head. And this is why we're such huge proponents of meditation. Uh, to help people get to the state where they set themselves free from the unreasonable uh, demands of the ego, which, you know, self-centeredness and egocentricity uh, manifests as huge disorder in this world at the individual level and then all the way up through societal levels with the political polarization, etc. The more we come to acknowledge the kind of toxicity of the ego and that there are ways to liberate ourselves from that and think more of the higher good and of our higher soul connected with others, that can be very beneficial in our soul journey. Well, and I would just add that it can be very helpful to have a broader perspective of what's going on. I've been very well informed uh, by the work of Dr. Christopher Kerr, who is a hospice doctor, and he does studies on what's happening when people are in those final days, weeks, hours of death. And what they're doing is they suddenly start looking back at their life and all of the events that were going on. This seems to be an automated process through um, end of life dreams and visions, not necessarily, oh, of course, people get to the end of their lives and start looking back. This seems to be a, a sort of process that people are naturally led into where they start to look back and gain this perspective of their lives that they didn't have before and where significant events really played a role in their formative kind of how they got to where they are now. Now, when you're in the middle of one of these crises, the last thing you really wanna be doing is saying, oh gosh, what's my lesson here? What lesson should I be learning? That's very useful to do, but it's also very challenging. Primarily when you're in the middle of a conflict, you wanna really get through that conflict constructively and uh, deal with all of the things that need to be done. You don't want to be suppressing emotions and avoiding conflict. You want to really get it out and uh, have a look at it. But this perspective can really, really help. And when you get it at the end of your life, you can also get it before you die as you're going along. And so I often recommend a daily review. And so when people are encountering different uh sort of scenes throughout their day, conflicts and challenges, find a moment later in, in the day when you have a quiet moment and contemplate, go in and kind of review that situation and do it from a perspective, not just from how you were hurt, but how you, what your role 
was that led up to that particular situation. Now, sometimes this could be the death of a, of a loved one, which you might think you had, you know, no role to play in that death. But then you want to say, well, how is this death affecting me? How can I respond to this death to help others around me who are also dealing with a similar situation? What can I do to make this situation better instead of focusing on the other all the time? And so just having that perspective, finding a way to go within and getting quiet, you know, like we talked about, finding that viewpoint of the neutral observer, all of that can help us to gain that broader perspective of different challenges. And sometimes it can take days, weeks, months, even years to get through those challenges before we really realize what might have come from it. But, you know, I see people, uh, you know, who've been bombed in Iraq and lost their leg and they, they could just go into a, a suicidal depression, but instead, you know, some of them become para-athletes and there's all kinds of choices we can make in those moments that will affect that unfolding experience. So being aware of our choices and making them in a way that serves ourselves and others at their highest good is, is always recommended. That is unbelievable. Awesome. Thank you so much. Really an honor to get to know you guys better. I know our listening audience are going to really enjoy the show. And listening audience, uh, please go to uh, the website that we'll include in the in the show notes. Pick up the book, Living in a Mindful Universe. Um, I, I think there's a lot that you guys uh, get kind of, uh, you know, tapped into. But I, I know there's a lot more that we our listening audience can learn from the work that you guys have done. And so grateful to, to get acquainted today and um, wish you guys continued health and safety. Uh, as, as we all face hurdles in life, you know, I, I think about doing three things each and every day that have helped me. And, and I'll repeat them for our listening audience again. And first and foremost, that's find the courage to be grateful, regardless of how powerful your storm is. Secondly, be truly present to those you're with. You'd be amazed at the gifts that are right in front of you if you're truly present. And lastly, pay attention to how you're feeding your mind, your body, and your soul. Again, today's guest was Dr. Eben Alexander and Karen Newell. If today's conversation inspired you in some way, shape, or form, please subscribe to the show, comment on it, and share it with others. Until next time, with gratitude, Matt listeners, find the courage to be grateful. Godspeed, my friends.